So for those who don't know Manulife, Manulife is 130 plus years old insurance company. It's based out of Canada, and it's present in more than 12 markets in Asia. And like any other company these days, it is going through transformation, which means we do agile. We also work in scrums, and we work in sprints. So what, what does that mean? This means we are going through a change. But ironically, this is the most dreaded word in the organization. Whenever we use this word and deal with developers, PMs, and other people, and other stakeholders, it seems like we are trying to do something which is like this. Like we have dropped a nuclear bomb on them. And they're like, no, why we are changing? Old design is good enough, why do we need to change? How do we know this change is better? Why can't we use old design? We don't have enough resources. Why we have to change at all? New design is complicated. Does anyone feel like that? Has anyone has faced these similar challenges in your organization? I'm sure most of us face these challenges on a daily basis, right? But why this happens? Why they view our changes with skepticism? Why don't they don't see it as an opportunity? Is it because we are wrong? Like we as designers are wrong, trying to do something just for our own sake? Or is it because they are wrong and they don't understand? If they are not wrong and we are not wrong, then what's going on? Do they have genuine concerns? Maybe they have. Are they resistant to change? Maybe they are. Or is it that they don't understand the value of design? They think design is just not good enough. It's just like any other design. We can just make this uh, image is more bigger, and that's it. We don't need to change design. And thanks to previous speaker, Saptarshi, I will pick some points from there, because this is where it connects, and it's nicely segues from there. Uh, so this is a famous quote from Henry Ford, and it, it goes like this, is that if you asked uh, people if they would prefer a car, and he would have got the answer that they would prefer faster horses. Because people are blocked or constrained by their own frame of references. So, so based on our previous experiences, we form the expectation of the future. We anticipate the future as we experience the past. And our past experiences guide our future thinking. And this is what happens when we are trying to deal with change as well. When you're trying to deal with change, people are stuck in their past bubble. And they're not able to break that frame of constraint. They get blinded by the expectation they have based on their, uh, their experiences and their anticipations. So if you ask people if they have better, if, they, if you give people better camera, they will ask for even better camera and it will never stop un until someone comes and disrupts it and changes it. So what's the reason behind it? Why we have this, uh, this cycle of challenge and then uh, why people are stuck in this cycle forever? So this is basically a psychological theory where it says that when people have a particular solution in their hand, they are kind of confined with that solution. So once you give some, someone something, they're happy with that. They don't want to change. They don't want to think beyond what they already have. And once they have something, they think this is what they need. So they are unable to think from a fresh perspective. They are unable to think beyond what they already see. And this, cre this creates a big creative block or a big thinking block 
where we can't see beyond what we see. And what we do is we just solve basic problems, but we don't actually innovate. And we end up with this circle of disappointment where we go with excitement and present our designs and then we are shut down and turned down and we are told this design doesn't work because we can't change, uh, we should not change, or we already have existing design which works for us. Is this a unique problem? Is this a new problem which we have because of technology? Or is this something which has been there for ages and we have been dealing with it? Anyone used this before? Okay, so there are people who are old enough <laughs> who have used this, so that's good. Is this available in the market anymore? So, did you guys know Kodak was the first company to invent digital camera? So Kodak invented the digital camera, but they never released in the market. The CEO told the inventor that we cannot go with this in the market because we are in the film business and we sell films. And if we create a digital camera, nobody will f buy our films, which means we will be out of business. So he saw a problem having a digital camera and didn't see an opportunity which could be there. And where is Kodak now? What about Nokia? Nokia was the market leader. Everyone had Nokia phone at least uh, in Asia for sure. Or at least in India where I came from. And Nokia was innovating in its own way. It used to release hundreds of new models and each model tried to push a boundaries of what existed. But it didn't survive. It didn't survive when Android came and when iPhone came. So what made Nokia lose the market share and eventually the whole business when it was the market leader? It invested in Symbian OS, which was the legacy OS for Nokia and they could not break out of their legacy. Their legacy became a problem for them. And they could not compete and people moved on and people moved on to Android and iPhone from there. And more recently, Thomas Cook, everyone knows the story. I don't need to repeat, right? So we can move on. So the reason is that instead of focusing on future, those companies focus on past. They are more scared by the future, but they are more comfortable with the familiarity. They find solace in the familiarity and they want to stick to that uh, family environment and family market. So they don't want to disturb that. So some of the reasons for that is they fear unknown. There's legacy that resist change. Then there is a filter bubble. Filter bubble means that they only see things they want to see. So they ignore things which doesn't align to their value system. They ignore ideas, they ignore opinions which doesn't align with their uh, goals and objectives. And then there's a lack of shared vision and then there's a scale and lack of agility. So they are big, but they are not fast enough, they are not flexible enough to change. So what does this mean? If I think it from my own perspective, working in insurance industry, I need to deal with this on a daily basis because we deal with compliance and regulatory um, departments. And if anyone knows financial industry, Compliance and regulatory departments are too hard to change. They don't want to change because it's not in their favor. They want to bring in more challenges to you. 
because they want to make things more complicated. They like to make things complicated. So uh, what we face on daily basis is that when we go to compliance and when we go to regulatory, we are turned down and we are told that uh, we can't change because this is not something we have been doing. This is not something we did in the past. This is not something we have tried. This is not something we want to do. And they come up with stupid ideas, like why can't we make the form, which needs to be acknowledged as a disclaimer, show up for at least one minute, make sure they scroll down, make sure they tick, make sure they double confirm they have read the acknowledgement, and then we proceed. So they are more interested in introducing more efforts just to make sure that compliance is met, but they are not interested in solving the problems which makes things easier and better for the user. And, and these are some of the reasons why it happens, because they are not comfortable with unfamiliar. They're not comfortable with unknown. So moving on from there, we have IBM. IBM used to make computers. IBM made mainframe computer as well, which was before PCs came in. These days, what does IBM do? IBM no longer makes hardwares. IBM makes softwares and services. IBM transformed from a hardware company to a software company. Nintendo, does anyone know how Nintendo started? Any guesses? Yes, playing cards, that's right. So they started making playing cards and they were quite good at that. They made playing cards and from playing cards, they transitioned to making hardwares and games and now they are the one of the world's best gaming company, doing both hardware and games. And then Netflix. Netflix started as a DVD rental company. They used to rent DVDs, then they have websites, then they moved into subscription. Now they are doing content. So they sponsor contents, they make their original content, and they are quickly moving away from the um, model they had before. So they are transformed the model at least four times in the past. So how these companies can do it successfully compared to other companies which could not do it? So we saw that those companies which failed were more focused on the past whereas these companies are more focused on the future because they can anticipate what's going to happen and they can change to respond to that change. So they can transform themselves responding to the external and uh, external internal changes. So what they are doing is they are focusing on what's next, what people are looking for, what people want, what people expect, how technology is changing, how market is changing, and they respond to that and then change. So we can see that how these things are totally opposite for these companies. Whereas one is focused on the past, the other one is focused on the future. One is scared of uncertainty, un scared of unknown. The other one is willing to explore, willing to experiment, willing to find what's next, what's new. While one is stuck in the filter bubble, the second one is trying to explore, have anticipatory, anticipatory mindset and see uh, what they can do to break out of that filter bubble, how can they make them and keep them competitive, keep them current, keep them forward thinking. So as we have seen, the technology is changing very fast. In the last few decades, things have changed drastically. It's only a few decades since we have the first computer. And now the mobile we carry has more power 
than the computer we had in the recent years. So if we are living in such a fast-paced and changing, rapidly changing world, what happens then? If you live in such a fast-paced world and you don't change, the gap increases. So technology change at exponential rate, but organizations can't keep up with that change. And if they can't keep up with that change, the gap increases. And the bigger the gap is, the higher the chances to fail. If the gap keeps going bigger, it's kind of certain if you, you will fail. So that's, that's uh, common for the organizations to have. And that's what I'm trying to do is, uh, my role at Money Life is to make sure that we bridge this gap. We don't let this gap to ha widen. We don't let this gap to happen. And what we are trying to do is we are trying to build um, methods, processes, and techniques which allows us to think beyond current, which allows us to think beyond now, which allows us to think beyond what we deliver day and day basis. So how some of these organizations save or transform or change to respond to these technological changes and other socioeconomic changes. Um, one is obviously agile, which is the buzzword everyone knows, everyone keeps talking about it, and I have to include it in my presentation as well. Uh, so agile, everyone has to be more focused on agile approaches these days, so that's how you respond to the change faster. Another thing is to have a shared vision. If your vision is stronger and everyone, is, everyone shares that vision, believes in that vision, it makes it much easier. But how do you get to that vision? How do you find that vision? That's a challenge in itself. And how do you know it's the right vision? And then once you have the vision, you have to execute it. Can you execute it? Do you have the uh, right skills and capabilities to execute it? Can you do it in a timely manner? So all these challenges surround these kind of thinking and solutions which we kind of project in the future. Because if the future is not known, the solution we are building is also not known how challenging it can be. So someone needs to make sure that everyone believes in the vision, everyone understands the vision, and everyone is willing to work on that vision. And we find the right people, time, and capacities to execute that vision. And that's what separates the organizations who are reactive than who are anticipatory. So reactive organizations just react to what's happening. They react based on what happened in the past. They react based on the information which came from historical data. They don't react on information based on projections of the future. Organizations which are there on the top are the ones who imagine the future and who make it possible. So, hindsight provides what happened. And hindsight is the historical data. It tell us, tells us what, what has happened. So organizations looking into past data and just analyzing what has happened and just based on that, they try to make changes, then they are just reacting to something. They're reacting to something which has happened in the past. So if you're using Google Analytics and you're just looking at the data and saying, okay, how many people have clicked? How many people have visit these pages, what they have done. This is hindsight. It has already happened. You're looking at the data which has happened in the past. But what you derive from it is insight. It tells you why it had happened, why it has happened, and what, what could be the possible reasons it happened. 
So insights tells us why it is happening, what could be the reasons, what could be the motivators, what could be the detractors which makes these things happen. But then we have foresights. And foresight tells us what could happen and how to make it happen. So insight tells us about the experience, the past experience. It gives us the information which helps us build the understanding of the experience we had. Whereas strategy derives, is derived from the insights which we gather. We gather the insights, we build the strategy, and that strategy helps us to optimize our processes, optimize our designs, optimize our uh, solutions, and optimize the our whole organization, basically. And then we have foresight. And foresight is where we get the vision. Foresight tells us how to get to something and what that something could be. So it tells us how to innovate. And there we get the vision of what we should do or what we could do. And how do we generate foresights? The first thing to generate any foresight is to anticipate. Basically, anticipation is how you speculate what could happen. And all the nice illustrations you saw in the previous presentation, that's kind of part of anticipation, where you see how people imagine the future and imagine the uncertain, and trying to bring something tangible to it and say, OK, this is which could happen. But if it's purely imagination, then how it can be useful to us? Because we are not living in an imaginary world. We are living in a world which is very much real and has real consequences and real uh, implications. And that's where we have to also think of using other ways to generate foresights, which is not just imagination and our gut feeling, but also uh, data-based and uh, other kinds of methods which we can use. So once we anticipate, we can imagine future and we can imagine different kinds of future. There are alternate futures and these alternate futures can be of any, any kind of um, possibilities or probabilities. These futures belong to different categories because they have different uh, potential to become real. So here we have is uh, preferred, probable, plausible, and possible. And then there's another one called impossible. So impossible falls in the category where you imagine, uh, but it's just imagination and it's very different to make it real. So teleporter most likely is an impossible um, thing for us at this point because there is no advanced theory yet supporting this notion of teleporter. But what's probable right now is high-speed train because it's happening right now. But what's plausible is Hyperloop because Hyperloop is in the construction but it's not tested and operationalized yet. So that's how uh, different versions of the future can vary. And organizations can pick their own preferred version based on where they want to be and how they want to be. So that's where the preferred version comes in. The preferred future is the future where the organizations feel most comfortable and most excited about going to. So we can say that the future is not a linear future. For organizations which are experimental, their future can be a multidimensional future where we don't see things and we don't see progress happening in a linear way. It happens in a multidimensional way. And how can we go there? 
from where we are, how can we go to the future we desire, the future we prefer? So we have to move away from the mindset we have right now in that case. If you or your organization thinks that you're stuck somewhere and you're not able to break away from everyday thinking and you're not able to break away uh, from doing the mundane stuff, you need to think how much you want to change and you need to think how can you change. And some of the things which you could do and you could think about is see if uh, what procedures you are following and is this helping you to solve problems? Because you don't want to get stuck in the procedures. You want to solve problems. You don't want to just deliver wireframes. You want to solve problems which actually makes impact, right? So if it's only a deliverable, it's just a checkbox on your deliverable or in your process, it doesn't add any value to anyone. So if you're just following procedures, then you should move away from procedures and start doing problem solving, solve actual problems. If you are just reacting to what is being told to you, if you're just reacting to the requirements which are given to you by, the, by business, you're not asking them questions, you're not asking them why, you're not asking them why we are doing this, just taking that requirements and converting them into design, you're reacting, you're not thinking. You have to stop reacting and you have to start thinking. You have to start anticipating as well what this could do to my users, what this could do to my business. Yeah, so similarly you can see here we have, you have to move away from how to to what if, you have to move away from the state of preservance where you are comfortable with what's there to the state where you can disrupt, you can do actual disruption. So, what should we do? So I would say that first thing we should be, is, we should do is, we should be humble. We should not be overconfident of what we are doing or what we can do. Because ego is the biggest uh, detrimental for innovation or uh, collaboration. Leave ego aside, be humble, don't be overconfident, and work with others to solve the challenges you have. Be more open-minded, be more flexible, understand the confirmation biases you have, understand other bi biases you might have, and try to deal with those biases. Find a way to address those biases, and don't get into that trap where these biases becomes a problem or becomes a creative block for you. Don't focus on the, just on the past. Don't just look into the past data. Also look into how can you generate foresights, how can you generate insights which can lead to foresights. And find a way to innovate. Find a way how can you uh, get the data not only from the internal stakeholders, internal organization data, but also from outside, from other sources you could have. So try to be open and and try to get as much data as you can from different sources so you just don't get uh, stuck into one kind of data or one source of data. Obviously you have to explore and don't settle for one kind of future, but explore multiple kinds of future. See what possible futures are and see which one you prefer and that's only be, will be happening when you're not looking into one future, you're looking into multiple futures. If you settle for one future, you're most likely going for the obvious, uh, the least effort way, uh, which kind of defeats the purpose, and then see how you can adapt to that future. And then definitely we have to share and collaborate because that's what makes innovation possible, that's what makes uh, the thinking which can translate into execution possible. So, how do we do it? 
it all sounds good in theory, right? How can we do it? How should we do it? So these are some of those steps which we can follow and we can see if we can make use of these and try to, try to come up with some sort of ideas, imaginations, possible futures, and then use it in our design and our organization. So data is a big part of it. How do you get the data? How do you organize the data? How do you analyze the data? And then how do you imagine it? How do you imagine the future? How do you adapt? How do you build the organizational culture and um, practices and processes around that? So um, I'm not going to go too deep into this because uh, this is a framework just for an anticipatory mindset and basically just says that this is what we can do to become more anticipatory. So this is where I will stop for this one, but I will just move into something else. So we talked about anticipatory mindset, and I just showed a framework about anticipatory mindset where we can use the information and we can anticipate what's happening in the future, and then we can adapt and react and, and uh, work around that possible emerging future, right? But how do you translate this mindset into an experience? How do you translate this mindset into an anticipatory experience and design products and solutions which can, offer, um, which can offer an experience which is more anticipatory in nature? So it's a little bit uh, on a different level. The next part of the talk is a little bit on a different level. So first, talk, first part of the talk, we talked about more on organization level and individual level. Here we are talking more about how do you bring it into your practice and how do you design something. So I will just go through quickly some of the trends we have been seeing so far. So one of the things we have seen is the, how data has increased in the last few years. So the data has increased exponentially and then now we are drowned in data and there is so much data that we don't know what to do with the data. But this also brings an opportunity to use that data for something better, for something greater. At the same time, this is a Gartner hype cycle for AI. And this Gartner hype cycle for AI shows that um, there are lots of emerging AI technologies which are ready for mainstream. And there are few more which will be ready for mainstream in a few years and then so on. And some of those you can see is ready in two to five years, which is very near, which means we can start using them and we can start using them to design our products and design our solutions. And then there's another trend which talks about personalization. And personalization is possible by data and AI. So if you look at these trends, it can tell, tell us something. It tells us that how we are moving from lots of choices and those choices which are generic to the choices uh, which are personalized and contextualized and relevant. So just to give an example, if you look at the, the internet five years back or 10 years back, you go to any portal and the portal looks same for everyone. Doesn't matter who you are, you logged into the portal and everything is same. Now, at present, it doesn't happen. Whether you log into Netflix, whether you log into e-commerce websites like Amazon or Lazada, or whether you log into any other portal, there are high chances that portal has been uh, designed in a way that it changes depending on who you are and what you're looking for. It understands who you are. It understands what you did in the past. It understands what you are going to do next. And it shows you suggestions and recommendations which it thinks might be suitable for you, might be relevant for you. So system is anticipating your needs. System is trying to guess what you will like. So now we have moved that anticipation process from the organization and our thinking and embed them into these systems. So these systems are anticipatory systems, which we're talking about. And these systems 
take the same concept and same idea of anticipation and apply them in a way that it shows us relevant information and relevant solutions, suggestions, and choices. So it optimizes the choice for us. It only shows us things which it thinks which are relevant, which means we don't need to deal with making unnecessary choices, which means companies can have better conversion, which means there are higher chances of customer staying through and not dropping off. Right? So that's how choice optimization will help businesses. Now, the second one is from passive, context-blind, dumb interactions, we are moving to proactive, context of intelligent interactions. So thing which we saw in choice, and now you can, uh, e-commerce e website, now you can see it in any other app you are using these days. Even it's a, whether it's a Grab or any other ride-sharing apps, they also have a, some understanding about who you are, where did you go last time, where will you go next, uh, where you are right now. So, so they show you something based on where you are. So that's a context. So they are context aware. They know where you went last time and they know where you might go next time. So they're intelligent. So they provide some of the intelligent interactions where they can prompt you or they can tell you what's happening. I'm not sure about Grab yet, but Uber shows you the time when you're going to arrive to your destination. So it predicts or anticipates when you might reach to your destination. So they are intelligent. And they tell you before you actually act on it. So they are proactive. You didn't ask Uber when I will reach. It showed you automatically that this is when you are going to reach. So it's, it has done that thinking for you on your behalf before even you have asked for it. So how does it affect the design? How does it change the design? So design has been changing a lot in recent years. And we know design has transformed a lot based on data and based on interactions and based on AI. So design has been moving from uh, different levels, from objects, from physical objects, intangible objects, to more intangible objects, like digital products we are making. So it, it has moved from architecture to communication to industrial to um, interaction design, which we talked about now. But we're already talking about system design. And what makes this system design possible is that data and uh, AI, which will make it possible. Because you need a strong in integration between different systems. You need to have data which can pass through these systems and generate more value than any of these systems could do standalone. Which means we are ready for that because we have enough tech feasibility at this point, which can make it happen. So I think this is what could make anticipatory experience possible, is that you need to have organization culture as well as data driven mindset and a resilience in the process, which allows you to quickly change and update your products. So if you talk about resilience, um, iterative solutions, agile, and scalable and feedback loop in that process has to be there to make it possible. Uh, for change, we have a culture and technology, so we need to have a shared vision, what's changing, why it needs to change, how it affects people, how it affects our behaviors. And then for intelligence, sensors, automation, AI, and so on. So it's a never ending list. So where, where are we leading to? When we talked about all these, where are we leading to? We are saying that there will be personalization. We are saying that there will be data. There will be uh, AI. And, and where does it all leading to? This is all about reducing the effort and also making sure that the devices and the apps or the products which we are using becomes more and more personal to us, becomes more like a friend and guide to us, rather than just a cold, um, another IT enterprise kind of website where it doesn't know, or it looks very hard. So uh, Matthew Dixon 
said that um, if you have to make sure customers are loyal, you have to reduce the effort of what they do. And this is kind of basic principle because people are lazy. People find the least effort way of doing things. You give them faster car, they are expecting more faster car because they are lazy. They want things better. Are we more, do we have more free time than before? Just imagine a world before we had smartphones. Do you have more time than that? Do you really have more time? I don't think so, you have more time. Imagine a world before computers, when everything was manual and you have to do with paper. Did computers help you save time? And you got more time? You got more time, but you got other things to do. So your time is utilized in a different way. Now you spend more time on Instagram. So that's why you use your time. So, so people are lazy. They want to save time. Not necessarily they have something to do. They just want to save time. So how does it fit into um, the matrix of intelligence and choice optimization? So how can we use intelligence and choice optimization to have some guiding principles for our design? So if we see, there is a horizontal axis which says choice optimization and there is a vertical axis which says uh, intelligence. And the higher on the axis, it means it uses foresight and the lower on the axis means it uses hindsight. And on the left side, it uses the um, it offers you more choices. It doesn't help you reduce choices. On the right side, it helps you reduce choices. So if you look at Google products, which uses it quite a lot and quite well. Um, so here you can see, I, I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, but basically this is a email. So Google, Google Mail or Gmail, it nudges you about the email you got a few days back and you didn't reply. And it will remind you that you have to reply. This. Do you want to reply to this email? So it's just kind of optimizing it. Because if you have to reply to this email, you have to go and find this email, click on that email, and then reply. It automatically put it on top of your email list, and then adds a message to it and says, uh, do you want to follow up? So that's optimization. It anticipates. It anticipates that you might have to reply to this email. email. And based on that anticipation, it just surfaces it up, right? Have you seen Google Duplex demo? So I'm not showing it here, but if you have not seen Google Duplex demo, I will just recap it a little bit. So it's, it's a wise AI-driven chat bot from Google, which can make calls, which can make calls and handle that calls by itself like booking an appointment at a restaurant, or at a barber, or anywhere. That chatbot will make a call, have a conversation as humans will have, and then make that booking or appointment possible for you. So what Google is doing there is relying on automation. You just need to feed in what do you want, and then that chatbot will handle everything for you. Prevention. So prevention is based on anticipating, anticipating something might go wrong. So you anticipate something might go wrong and you want to prevent from happening. So prevention is basically trying to say, okay, this is what has happened and you should not be doing this. For example, this is Android um, usage behavior on Android and, and this is Google Android 9. And Android 9 has this usage behavior report, just like Apple has. Apple has a weekly report, and Google Android has this one. It tells you how much time you have spent on mobile, and how much uh, social media you have used, and how much other applications you have used. So it's kind of anticipating that if you spend more time, it's bad for you. And it, because it is bad for you, maybe you should use less. And then because you should use less, it kind of anticipates um, what should be the right amount of time you should use. 
So that's prevention, but going a step further, it's anticipation. It projects into future. It does not talk about what happened. So this is Google Maps, and in Google Maps, you go to a restaurant, and in that restaurant, um, you click on the restaurant details, and in one of those details, there is a detail about timings and schedules of the restaurant. So there you see this when you see it on Google Map, and it will show you the most busy uh, times for that restaurant and less busy time for those restaurants. So it will show, give you a number. It will show you a graph. It will tell you, okay, this restaurant is busy at this time, and this restaurant is not busy at this time. And even if the time is beyond today, it will give you a projection based on what happened in the past. So it is anticipating that it's going to be similar based on previous pattern. But now, one more step further, it's augmentation. The difference is uh, that in anticipation, you didn't get any choices. You just got the information, you got the data. But when you look at Google Map, and you try to set a, set a direction, find a direction, or just or try to set a route for the car, or it will show you alternate, alternate ways to go there. You go, you type in your destination, you type in your, um, uh, type in your address, you type in your destination, then you type, uh, then you select how do you want to go. And you select car, it will show you the route. And then you can see there are three different ways to go. And it, it can tell you how long it will take based on each, each of those ways. So it's not only telling you how long it will take, it's also telling you which one is better. It's giving you a choice. It's helping you make a decision. And something which has not happened yet, but going to happen in future. Going to happen in near future by the time you will leave your, leave your location. Just some examples here. Uh, for optimization, you can, uh, sorry, it's a, no, it's a wrong title. For optimization, you can just basically see how you can optimize your interactions and which kind of data can you put by itself, just like you can see here. So it, it optimizes the interaction by just automatically filling details or data, or fetching the API data, or fetching the sensor data, which are most likely correct. So this way you can reduce some of the efforts a user has to make. Automation. For automation, you can see this Nest has an automation, um, uses automation AI. So basically, it automatically adjusts the temperature of the room based on your preferences. Similarly, this car by Jaguar also uses automation and it detects the face or facial expressions. And based on facial expressions, it will make a guess that you might need some help. So it will try to, for example, you, you are feeling stressed and that AI will detect you are feeling stressed. So it will try to change the temperature, try to turn on the music, try to do certain things which will, in its understanding, I mean, it's in the understanding of AI, it will try to reduce that stress. So it's kind of automating the whole uh, mood control uh, process. So you don't need to think what I need to do. You don't need to turn on the AC. You don't need to turn on the music. It will do it automatically for you. Prevention. Uh, in insurance, there is a, for for automobiles, we use something called telematics, and for um, healthcare, there's something called uh, health healthcare for smart bands like Fitbit or Apple smartwatch. So what these do is these also provide you some prevention uh, suggestions. So basically, why it does this, it 
collects all the data how a driver is driving the car, and based on that data, it maps that data, it analyzes that data, and it says, okay, this is the score, this is how you have been driving, the driving this is your report card. But it also provides some of the uh, ways driver can improve, uh, offer the ways to train, offers the ways to learn something better, offer the ways to control um, emotions. So, so those things can be offered based on the past data it is analyzing. On the right side, this is a patent done by Apple, and it's for iPhone. So basically, this patent is about a device. When the device is going to fall, it can detect it's going to fall, and it will change its orientation. So it's kind of anticipating the fall, and then it's going to change its orientation. So uh, it doesn't fall on its glass. It falls on the back or side. So. That's how you, the patent is. And Amazon has started doing something called anticipatory shipping. So anticipatory shipping is basically based on what you are buying, how you are buying, your past behavior. Amazon predicts that you're going to buy a particular product in the next few days. And Amazon will ship that product to the nearest hub so that it can be delivered to your home within a day. So they are predicting all these behaviors and patterns based on what you have been doing. And then we have more examples for augmentation. You can see here how it can help you make decisions, help you make your work easier. So it, for example, on Gmail again, it gives you option to reply. And it's anticipating again that what could be the possible replies you might want to give. So providing an option, providing a choice, providing not making a decision on your behalf, that's augmentation and not automation. If it makes decision on your behalf, that's automation. Same example, similar example here, it's for call center. And in this app for call center, basically it records and analyzes the voice of the agents. And based on that voice, it can provide suggestions what you should do so that you can deal with the case better. Yeah, so as I was saying that, that the choice optimization intelligence, there, there are a little bit differences um, in terms of how you handle each case differently. You can't optimize everything. You can't automate everything. You can't augment everything. There has to be a reason why you want to augment, why you want to uh, automate, and why you want to optimize. Not all of the interactions are equal, right? And not all of the problems are equal. So what we are supposed to do is we are supposed to make a call and, and, and one of the ways to do it is basically see how much confident are you that the decision I'm going to make on behalf of the user is the right decision and how much confident are you that the cost of that decision is not going to be high. So if you are confident enough, then you can make that decision on, your, on, the, on the behalf of the user. But not, then you can leave it. But as any design or any other uh, process and framework, we, we need to be careful about certain things. And this last section is all about um, dealing with design in a way which is not considered um, not considered unethical, not considered something which can make us fail, not considered something which can um, bring more challenges for us. So we have to be cautious about few things. And I will just walk through some of these things which we need to be cautious about. Because these, these while new data and then AI, these are good to have and these are good for our design and good for uh, solutions and augmentation and anticipation in general but there are certain things we need to be careful about so um, trust is fragile so uh, it takes some time to build trust right so we, we build trust we, we get customers we we gain their trust and we don't want to break their trust and it's very easy to break, uh, break that trust. So we don't want to abuse that trust. Uh, if you know about this case about Facebook, 
uh, Facebook has been selling the data for political advertisements. So um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of these cases. Uh, it, it was quite popular in news recently, and um, and in U.S. elections, especially presidential, uh, presidential elections, they have uh, the case where um, Facebook sold the data of profiles to a third party, and the third party basically used that data to segment the profiles and target these particular users of the Facebook with a biased advertisements to make sure that these guys vote for a particular candidate. And this, you might be aware as well, um, uh, like Amazon admit that Alexa listens to people's conversations. So unless you turn it off, it's listening to you. So we, talk, we, we just saw that um, trust is fragile and you don't want to break that trust, which means you don't want to abuse the data. If users are giving you their data, they are trusting you. They're trusting you with their data. And if you misuse, abuse, or use that data for some other undesired things, then it won't be good for sure, right? But machines are also biased. We can't trust machines completely as well. Um, machines have bias because we have bias. And we are the one who makes the machine. So machines are not free from the biases because we are not free from the biases. Right? So for example, here you can see uh, AI can predict who is going to be criminal based on certain characteristics. And these characteristics are given by who? Humans. And you can see here that it's not perfect. It can racially profile black people as criminals because someone told it to do that. And then Microsoft chatbot. Within a day, people trained it to do something which it was not designed to do. So you can't control how your design will be used, right? That's another challenge we have, is we never be sure what's going to happen once the design is out, once the product is out, and how people will use it. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's another thing which we need to be careful about. Like when we are designing and we are anticipating the future, we also need to think of negative sides of it. And machines can fail. They're not just biased, they can fail. And this is the, most, uh, this is the unfortunate disaster which everyone knows. Uh, how machine has failed. And this machine, basically the Boeing, Boeing plane, failed because of a sensor. And this sensor gave a wrong reading of data. And that wrong reading made it dive down. So it's, it's basically AI sensor used in a place where it should not be. It's a mission critical task. and and. And they didn't provide any kind of uh, fail safe to get out of it quickly. And that's where things happened in a way it should not have happened. Also, we are very prone to miss, uh, prone to manipulations. Uh, and everyone knows about dark patterns, right? So the way we anticipate, it can be hacked as well. For example, here, uh, Booking.com uses all these dark patterns all the time. And, and, and I'm sure most people know these, so I don't want to repeat. Um, but you can use the anticipation in your favor sometimes. So it's not always you know, against. It's not always about dark patterns. You can manipulate people to do something good. So how this works is basically this is a company which makes bicycle, and it exposed these bicycles. And but these bicycles were found to be broken when it was open at the other end. So it was getting damaged in the shipping process. And uh, the company was quite frustrated about this. And they were trying to find out a way to make it safer to ship without getting the bikes damaged. What they did is they packaged the bike in a TV box. Now, 
Now the uh, people who handle the cargo, they see is a TV box and they anticipate that because it's a TV, I should be handling it carefully. So their mental model has not changed. Their mental model is same as based on their past experiences, what they have been doing. And based on their past experience, a TV is fragile and TV needs to be handled carefully. And because this is in a TV box, this is a TV. So sometimes you can use anticipations in a way which can work in your favor. But when you are having uh, lots of data, when you are deciding on behalf of the user, you need to be careful about how far can you go, what responsibilities you have, and what you can do. It can easily be misused. It can easily be abused in a way where it can control your freedoms, control your decisions you are making. And when it does that, it can lead to a life which is different than what it could be. So everyone is aware of China's social credit system and how it uses the data and um, AI to track people and uh, blacklist them, or uh, profiling minorities or profiling criminals. So if you're making a product and if you are using AI and data, it's your responsibility to make sure that data and AI you are trying to use doesn't cross a line, doesn't cross a boundary, doesn't cross a limit where it is acceptable. And of course, machines can't replace humans. So um, yeah, so machines can't replace humans. So we have to make sure that we humanize our interactions and minimize the conflict in machines. All right. So I will just recap. So basically, this is what I talked about today. Uh, change, resilience, anticipation, intelligence. And this is what we need if we have to create a process which is anticipatory and which help us create anticipatory experiences. And that's it. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Aditya. So we have time for one question sure. still. Um, how did anticipate anticipatory experience in manual life, take it to where it is now. Are there any success stories that you can share with us? So I joined manual life uh, this year, so I'm not there for a while. But what we are trying is we are trying to build um, solutions which uses the rich data we have about the user. And we are trying to see how we can help them and preempt their needs. So we can preempt what kind of policies they might have, what kind of policies they might need because as they grow older, um, they might need certain policies. And as, as we get more information about the user and we know we can help find them right products with right coverage so they are not underinsured. And if they're not underinsured, it's good for them because if they're not underinsured, insured, so it's like they are safe and they, are, they can manage the risk when the risk comes. So what we are doing is basically taking those data and trying to integrate with the product. So as I talked about system design, right now that data sits separately and we have to just bring that data into the systems we are building. So that's where we are right now. Okay, thank you. And we'd like to give a token of appreciation to you. <laughs>